Good morning, everyone. Now, the topic I'm going to be talking about today is physics meets philosophy. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware of that. What a really, really strange topic. What's the relationship between a physical science and a social science? What's the relationship between the forces and the state of mind? Well, it all started off in ancient Greece. Now, Greece was the birth of science and thinkers. <clears throat> As I'm sure many of you are aware, there are many, many philosophers that originated in, in ancient Greece and many, many famous scientists. As a matter of fact, the two were so interconnected to the point that physicists that had their hypothesis failed were still considered as philosophers. Now, the reason why it wasn't as to add insult or injury to them, to either profession, but rather to show in regards, to rather show the interconnection between the two. Now, both of them are a school of thought. They are both abstract uh, subjects, I believe you can regard them, and they require a lot of intelligence and imagination. So that answers the why. Now, let's start off with a very, very famous philosopher, a physicist, self-proclaimed philosopher, and that is Isaac Newton. Now, I'm sure many of you heard the story about Isaac Newton sitting underneath a tree and an apple falling on his head, and then he discovered the idea of gravity. Now, usually when we think of when we're sitting underneath a tree and an apple falls on my head, I'll look up. But him, he came up with the law of gravitation. The law, the law of gravitation held true for many, many years. However, when it came to, on, when it, when it came to a much larger scale, such as a planetary scale, yeah, the, the calculations, they weren't always accurate. And the result of the fact that Newton wasn't able to explain where did gravity come from. It wasn't until the 1900s that a man by the name of Albert Einstein came up with a astounding theory, which is a general theory of relativity. Now for this, I'm going to need two volunteers. Anyone? Two volunteers. Yes, please. And one more. Anyone? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Now, the general theory of relativity is one of the most complex theories known to man, but I'm going to try and make it very, very simple. Now, I need you to hang on to two edges of the blanket and the other two sides. Spread it out like a trampoline. Now, before, many individuals thought that the universe was composed of a, new, of a Euclidean plane. You just spread it out. Like an XYZ axis. Einstein thought, however, that the universe is actually composed of a, fa of, a, of a fabric, mind you, called space-time. What it is is that basically, you guys mind just holding it for a bit? Perfect. Now, what he proposed is that the universe is composed of space-time. What is space-time? It is basically a fabric under which all objects occupy. The reason why he came, came up with the idea of space-time is because the two, I believe you can say, fields are connected. An object occupying a space, time must pass through. So this, not only does this solidify or make the calculations accurate when we'll talking about a planetary scale, that it also explains gravity. For example, why, do, why does the Earth orbit the Sun? It's quite simple. A massive object, such as this ball, will bend the space-time, this blanket, and the smaller objects will rotate around it. Of course, less massive objects always rotate around a more massive object. So, of course, he explained gravity. Thank you very, very much, Michael. Right? Now, of course, this explains gravity. All right, this also explains something very, very important. Time. Now, why? How does this explain time? Now, due to the bending in space-time continuum, this also bends time. So, theoretically speaking, let's say that you have a twin. You're both born on the same exact date, but one of you stays on Earth. The other one is sent to, let's say, Jupiter. Jupiter is a more massive object. Theoretically speaking, your your twin brother or twin sister would age at a slower rate due to the bending in space-time continuum. So, as you can see here, time is relative. Let's focus on that. That's really, really nice. Let's go to philosophy right now. There it is. This is René Descartes. Aside from having amazing hair, this guy is known as one of the founders of modern philosophy. Now, Descartes, in the late, in the mid-1600s, he decided to come up with a new school of thought. So there were, let's say that there's a table of philosophies. He wiped it all, and he started from the top, from the beginning. A clean slate. So the first thing he asked himself is, what is real? He was sitting down on his very nice, comfy armchair, I believe, enjoying the nice, I believe you can say classical music, reading the book so, and he asked himself, am I really here? Am I really sitting down on this chair, reading my book beside the, beside the fireplace? So then of course he said, well, maybe I could be in a dream. Because in the end, like whenever we're in a dream, we often can't differentiate between what is real, sorry, we can't differentiate between what is real and what is not real. In order to further aid his experiment, he, I, I believe you can say he incorporated an imaginary being, or a demon, if you will, in order to <coughs> reduce the chance, in order to, in order to further explain his idea. Now, what Descartes wanted to explain was that if there's a slightest percent, even the smallest, 
a fraction upon a fraction percent of something not being real, it's off the table. So common ideas between what is between actually being here was regarded because you could be in, was disregarded because you could be in a dream. Common mathematical equations such as two plus two makes four was also disregarded because that demon could force us or manipulate us into always counting the wrong thing. Even the most basic ideas, the common principles such as the color of the shirt that I'm wearing is disregarded. Because I'm, because we can all agree that the shirt I'm wearing is, I believe you can say maroon, but your idea of maroon could be periwinkle blue, your idea of maroon could be magenta, and so on and so forth. So then he started slowly to realize one universal truth, and that is the only thing that he can prove is the fact that he is doubting everything around him, which later on resulted in the very famous saying, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Now let's go back to a bit of physics. Now, there's another guy called Thomas Young, very famous quantum physicist known for a very, very strange and unique phenomenon called the double slit experiment, or Young's experiment, if you will. Now, many of you guys have a flashlight at home, of course. I think whenever you try and shine it through a hole, what happens is that the light particles will travel in a straight path. Similar, whenever you're at the local pool and it's a really hot summer day, you decide to go cannonball into the pool, and of course, it'll cause ripples or waves. So as you can result from this, particles exhibit two properties. They either behave as particles or as waves. However, when Young decided to shine, a, let's just say, a flashlight for simpler purposes, through two slits, something strange happened. From one slit, of course, light travels in a particle, and from two slits, he decided to behave as a wave. Curious by this phenomena, he decided to place microsensors uh, beside the slits, as you can see over there, beside the slits, in order to monitor and explain why it's behaving like a wave. And the truly astounding thing is, as soon as he fired up the the flashlight, it starts behaving like a particle again. So he removed the sensors, and again, it went back to behaving like a wave. So therefore, the only conclusion that he could draw was that quantum particles behave relative to how you observe them. And as you can note, there's a lot of relative, there's a lot of the use of the word relative in this presentation. The reason why is because as far as physics and philosophy go, as far as they are different, they can agree on one thing. Everything is relative to how you observe it. Let's take, for example, this, the most basic common scenario, a rich man and a poor man. The rich man will argue that he is rich in a sense of, cur of currency, in terms of materialistic objects. However, the poor man might argue that he is rich in a sense that he has knowledge and experience. He knows the ins and outs of the local city, etc., etc. Now, objectively speaking, they both know what is, they both have in their possession what they believe is more valuable. Subjectively, what is more valuable, however, is subjective to what they believe. Let's go something about something that is more universal, something that is more, I guess you can say, black and white. What about what is right and wrong? Now, we can all agree that it's wrong to murder someone or to imprison someone, correct? However, at the same time, many people say that the death penalty for committing murder, that, sorry, that the punishment for committing murder should be the death penalty. So in this case, we do find a justification for murder. At the same time, let us say that, for example, someone steals something from you, you put them in jail. So this is also a justification for imprisonment. So of course, what is right and what is wrong, what is morally right and what is morally wrong, is subjective to what you believe. That's a, now, of course, what is right and what is wrong, okay, there may be room for greater, but the truth, that's definite, that's absolute. Not exactly. Now, let us say, for example, that I keep, that I give birth to a child, and I keep, that, and I keep this child locked in a room for 10 years, with the most obscene lies. For example, the sky is green, the grass is blue. Now, of course, when I ask this child, every single day, of course, he's going to say the sky is green, the grass is blue. Relative to what he believes, relative to the knowledge that he is given, he is saying the truth. But is it really the truth? As a matter of fact, you really need to ask yourself, what is the truth? The truth, of course, is a subjective reality, of course. Unless you're talking about even the most basic facts can be I guess you can say manipulated, depending on, depending on the knowledge that you are given to the person. So to wrap it all up, what I believe is the relation between the two is that how we observe the universe. And there's this quote by this very interesting gentleman, Nietzsche, which is, you have your way and I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it simply does not exist. Thank you very much.